this video, I want to talk about dealing with problem players. This is something that comes up, I mean, certainly a couple of times a week on Twitter. I have people reaching out to me. They often tag me, Matt Mercer, Chris Perkins, and they say, uh, how do you folks deal with problem players at the table? And there are some stock answers. I have my own stock answers, and I think some of them are useful. I think some of the useful ones tend to be maybe also glib. And so I thought this is probably not the kind of thing we can cover in one video because the subject of problem players is as complex as the number of people playing the game. I mean, each, I can't, unfortunately, none of us, regardless of how much we might want to help, or how much we know or how much we've learned, none of us can audit your game. None of us are there at the table with you. And so our ability to solve problems like that are actually quite limited. A lot of this advice is either going to immediately make sense to you and you go, ah, oh, yes, I can do that, or it's not going to make sense. It's not going to be immediately applicable, in which case I apologize. But like I said, I'm not one of your players. I'm not you. I can't sit there at the table and give advice. And even if I were, and even if I could, that's no guarantee that my advice would be any good. I'm not a psychologist. I am not an expert in human dynamics. And that's one of the, uh, the, the great benefit of Dungeons and Dragons is that this is something we all do together at the table. And it fulfills that primitive monkey need to have face-to-face -face time. That face-to-face -face interaction is, I think, one of the reasons human beings have self-awareness, is our ability to look at another face and imagine what that face is thinking. That's the positive side, is it fulfills that need to have face-to-face -face interaction. It's one of the reasons I don't think that, like, digital will ever kill uh, tabletop. I think they work very much together, and you play one for a while, then you want to play the other. The downside of that is that it, along with this thing we do sitting together at the table, comes all of the complexities of human interaction. All of them can happen at the table. It's like what Shakespeare said about the stage. All of these dramas can play out at the table. There's no way, there's no one stage stop shop, no magic bullet, no easy way to solve these. That being said, these are some of the things that I have learned. And again, I do think this is probably going to be a multi-part series. Part two might be months from now. That's the way I tend to do things. But this is my first stab at it. The two most popular questions I get on Twitter seem to be unrelated, but I'm beginning to suspect that they are related. And the first one is, how do I deal with this problem player? And the second one is, how do I get players to engage with my content? And it makes me wonder if what we're really seeing is I have one problem player, I have all problem players. In other words, there's a misalignment in both instances between what the dungeon master is hoping is going to happen and what is actually happening. And in one case, it's just one player. And in another case, you don't think of them as problem players because it's the whole group, but the reality is they're not engaging. They're not playing the kind of game you want to run. Those of you who've been following me for a while know that I like to give my best advice first. I don't mind doing long videos. This video may be half an hour long. Who knows? I think any video longer than 12 minutes is a long video. Uh, who knows how long this video will be, but hopefully you can only watch the first five or six minutes and get the best stuff and the best advice I have to give you is if you are experiencing a problem with a player at the table, I am here to assure you, you are not the only person who thinks that. You are not the only player and person at the table, by, by which I mean, even you, the dungeon master, you're not the only person at the table who thinks this is a problem. And you are not alone at the table. Even though we talk about it being the dungeon master's game, and often I'll even do this, it's the DM's table, and we expect the DM to have some authority. And in fact, I think good dungeon masters need to have an air of authority. It's important that when the dungeon master describes things in the world, the players believe that these things are real. And that comes from a certain degree of authority. But whence comes that authority? It comes from the other players. It is granted to you by the other players. They are complicit in the process because this is an endeavor we are all doing together. And that that authority the dungeon master has is purely illusory. You're only one person among four, five, six, seven at the table. And if you have a problem player, I, I advise you to consider talking to that player at the table with everyone else. In fact, when the player is doing something obstreperous, which is a phrase my uh, grandparents used to use, when they are acting out, when they are trying to stomp on the other player's fun, when they are trying to play their own wildly different version of Dungeons and Dragons than the one you're trying to run, Try turning to the other players and asking them if they are okay with this. Am I the only person who is not having fun right now because of this? Now, that player 
is going to feel attacked. And that's a terrible feeling. And there are things you can do to mitigate that at the table. But you have to confront the player one way or the other if you want to resolve the issue. And you can do it offline, which is a lot of advice that we see, you and the, that player talking, and, and you know your player better than I do, and that may work. But I find that being at the table and calling out this behavior at the table shows that player that they are one person among many, and they get to see everyone at the table's reaction. And that process of socialization has a huge impact on that player. I have started conversations like this at the table by saying, listen, I'm going to pick a name that isn't a member of any group I'm in right now or that I know. I would say, listen, Steve, I want you to have fun playing D&D with us. That's an important way to phrase it because it begins by saying, I value you. You specifically by name are important and I want you to have fun playing with us. And that's where we segue into the reality. We've, we've complimented that player to a certain extent. We've respected them. And then we say, but I am not having fun right now. And I suspect the other players are in one way or another having the same experience. Steve, I want you to have fun playing D&D with us. But I also want to have fun. It's important that we all get along and that we all enjoy this process. And right now it seems like you want different things from the game than the rest of us do. And that's a very neutral way of putting it. It is a very, I think, non-confrontational way of putting it. But it is still a confrontation. And one of the problems, and this is something you learn if you're ever a manager of employees at a job, one of the problems with confronting anyone about this stuff privately or in front of the group is that they perceive the problem to be the conversation we're having right now. These people are calling me out on my nonsense and maybe they didn't even think they were, they were uh, doing anything bad. So suddenly people are talking to them and saying, Hey, we're not having fun because of you. And that experience is a negative experience. The conversation they're having at the table is now a negative experience. It is something to be endured and it's something to be gotten out of immediately. They're going to want to go back to that state before the conversation started when they, they from their point of view we were all just having fun playing dnd they didn't know they were a problem player until about 30 seconds ago but now you've made it clear and now they just want this conversation to be over and they will do or say the things they need to do or say in order to end the conversation because they see the problem as being in this conversation and once the conversation is over they will relax and they'll think, okay, I solved that problem and go back to doing what they were doing before, but send them to this video. So they know they get, they get the straight dope and they know that that's not how it works. The conversation we're having in which we talk to you about the fact that we think you're disrupting our game is only the beginning of solving the problem. The end of that conversation, nothing's happened yet, except we've had a talk. Now the process is, can we get along and can we all play this game together? Because at the end of the day, if you can't, then either you're going to need to play something else or somebody's going to have to leave. I thought about making a video where I just addressed the problem player and said, hey, if you've been sent a link to this video, it's because your friends are having a problem and they hope they can resolve it, but they're afraid they're going to have to ask you to leave and they don't want to do it. So I'm doing it. Maybe you should find some other people to play with. I know that sounds harsh, by the way. Maybe you should find some other people to play with. But in my experience, there probably actually is a group out there for everyone. I've been in groups, uh, it, it rarely lasted longer than one session, where I thought these people are all wang rods. These people are all, this is a very toxic group. And it's full of a whole bunch of individuals, all of whom are just sniping at each other and trying to score points and being sarcastic and they're all misanthropes and I don't fit in and I get out of that group. But then later I think this, those people are all happy playing together. To me, it seems incredibly dysfunctional, but these people have been playing together for years and they enjoy each other's company and they enjoy the game they're playing. So that means that this one problem player I have in my group, there's a group out there for that player. The most common answer you're going to see and you're going to get if you go online and ask how do you deal with a problem player is talk to that player, communicate with them. And that is a, that is, that is quite good advice. The problem with that advice is it implies that there is a solution. That if you have a problem player at the table, if only you were smart enough, if you were uh, a good enough judge of character and knew how to say the right thing, you could fix the problem. I don't think that's true. I think communication is key in all human interactions. I think setting expectations is equally important. But at the end of the day, we must accept that sometimes these misalignments cannot be corrected 
It's not meant to be. So don't get frustrated if you feel like you're at your wit's end and there's no solution in sight, because sometimes I think that is the answer. Uh, there's no reason to be frustrated. You're already at the end of the problem, and the end is one of us has to find a different group or play different games. And that's another thing I fundamentally believe, and this has a lot to do with my, my experience. If I had played in different groups, I am sure I would have different answers. But because of the way I played and the people I played with over the years, I believe that the best D&D groups are groups of friends that get together to play games anyway, outside of D&D. D&D is a fantastic game, but I don't think it's fair to expect this one thing we do together to solve all of our gaming needs. I think a healthy group gets together to play lots of games. One of the things I have noticed in my own experiences, and my experiences are not comprehensive or universal, one of the things I've noticed in my experiences is that there's often a correlation, maybe it's not one-to-one, -one, but there is a correlation between players who are showing up at the table just to play D&D and problem players. Anytime in the past I've had a player express to me the sentiment that they're just there to play D&D &D and they're not interested in playing anything else, that's when I know, uh-oh, this is a problem player. This is going to turn into an issue. Because I think ultimately the best, the healthiest groups, and you can have a successful group that isn't like this, but the healthiest groups I've played with were people who were friends outside of the game. They got together on a regular basis to play games, one of which was D&D. &D. And when the Dungeon Master got burned out, that was okay. The group didn't collapse. We just switched to another game, not even necessarily an RPG. And this gets down to that principle of sportsmanship that I sometimes fear is is lacking uh, in our culture these days. That notion that, okay, so you don't like playing Robo Rally, but you'll play tonight for a couple of hours because you realize that's part of being a good sport is I will play this game that's not my favorite, but then next week I'll get to play the game that I do really love and we each short, sort of put up with a little bit of that. You can already see how compromise, what well, thing I just described is all about compromise. Compromise is key to maintaining a good and healthy group and the fact that just because things didn't go your way this week, you're gonna deal with that and then next week they will go your way and you can say that, you can say, okay, I'll put up with this, I'll play this game and I'll be a good sport about it and I'm not going to grumble and I'm not going to grouse. I'm going to I'm going to be a good sport, but then I want to play this other game and that's just part of the normal low-level negotiations that are part of being any group. Every healthy group I've ever been a part of and I've been a part of several have had that kind of interaction. That's part of my advice is try to be the kind of group that gets together and plays other kinds of games because otherwise I don't think Dungeons and Dragons can shoulder the burden of fulfilling everyone's expectations and needs every week. So we've talked about a couple things already. We talked about the idea that talking to the player is a good idea and necessary, but it's not necessarily going to solve the problem. You may be fundamentally incompatible, and that has to be okay. We've also talked about the idea that healthy groups, I think healthy groups, allow themselves to play other games so that not this one game doesn't shoulder the burden of solving all of our problems. But I also want to talk about, like, what is it that makes someone a problem player? When I hear people asking questions online, saying, how do I deal with this problem player? What types of things are they asking about? What I typically see is they're not taking the game seriously. That's a big one. They want to hog the spotlight or they want to take all the magic items for themselves. They want to be perceived as the smart player who's solving, who's the one who's coming up with all the solutions for all the problems. And the other player should listen to them because they're smart. And I think this also relates to the idea of a player who wants to manage the other players and tell them what to do and gets upset when the other players aren't conforming to their ideas about how the game should be played, their character should be run, why they would choose one character over another, what they do in combat. I did a video a while ago on different types of players, and maybe I should have done a better job of explaining that all those different types of players, which are part of our vernacular, the tactician, the actor, stuff like that, all of those types of players are just normal. There, there's room for all of those players in any group. I think every group needs one good tactician. Being a tactician player, being, you know, a, um, a min-maxer, I don't remember what the term for this guy was, being an actor, none of these things are pejorative. Any of them can turn into a problem when that player is a wang rod. 
Being a tactician player just means you think tactically. Being a wangrod means you expect everyone else to conform to your ideas about how the table should be run, about how combat should be run, and that's a problem. It's my goal to make sure that you, the dungeon master or the prospective dungeon master, understand that while you do have authority at the table, it is your game, and to a certain extent it is your table, you are not their parents, you are not their boss, you're just someone else in the group trying to have a good time, and you have taken the burden on yourself of doing a lot of work. Being a dungeon master is fun, and I don't think it's hard, but there is a lot of the work involved. And so I think you deserve some credit. It is sort of up to you to bring these things up, but it is not up to you to solve them. This is something the group can solve together. What do you guys think about this? Am I the only one who feels like maybe Steve is trying to run other people's characters? Steve, it seems like you're getting really frustrated that other people aren't playing as tactically optimally as you would like them to, but I'm here to tell you that it's okay. Real people in the real world often don't do things that are tactically optimal. We have to let each other play our own characters. It's one of the reasons I use the phrase, I don't think you're here for the same reasons the rest of us are. I'm not making a value judgment about why you're here. The, 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 the things that you're doing might be perfectly reasonable in another group. But right now, you, Steve, are the outlier. Everybody named Steve watching this video is like, why, 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 why me? No, I'm, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about hypothetical Steve. That's the advice I have. I hope it is useful. This won't be the only video we do on the subject. I'm going to be reading the comments. I'm going to be watching the response online. And I'm going to see where did my advice fail? And can I make another video that covers that stuff? But in brief, remember that while you are the dungeon master, you are not the only person at the table. There's a whole group of people there, and you are almost certainly not the only person who is not having a good time because of this one problem player. Lead with a statement that reinforces the fact that you can you want to play D&D with that player because that helps them feel included. But emphasize that you also want to have fun, as do the other players. And if you can't all find a way to do that together, then you're going to find a way to do it without them. And just remember that having this conversation is going to be difficult. People's skin is going to crawl. Nobody likes being confronted. Nobody likes that feeling of being attacked. But there's no way to do this without putting that player on the spot. And they will perceive the conversation itself as being the problem to solve. And that once the conversation's over and they're rolling dice again, that everything's fine and back to normal. But you can even show them this video and make sure they understand that, it, that it's not they've only just begun the process of integrating into the group. Like I said, I can't audit your group, and even if I could, my advice might not be very useful. Only you know whether it would be better to talk to that player alone uh, or talk to that player with one or two other players there, but I just want to suggest the idea that you do it at the table. This is a collective endeavor, and it's a mistake to think that because you're the dungeon master, you are solely responsible for fixing interpersonal problems. That is not true. This is something we do together, it is something we do to have fun, and the other players also can help you solve this problem, and they probably want to. They're probably just waiting for somebody, and this is really your only job, to begin the process of fixing this. And once you start talking about it, you will discover that the other players at the table are more than willing to help you solve the problem because they want to have fun too. This is a short video for what is a complex issue because the things we do at the table are as complex as all human interaction. So look forward to more videos in this subject. Get, you know, Post your own experiences with this in the comments and come by tonight on Twitch, uh, Twitch TV slash Matt Colville, and we will continue the process of building the Pantheon and the culture and eventually the city and the streets and the NPCs and the shops and everything for the campaign that I will soon be running. Regardless of what kind of game you want to play, there is a group out there for you. It's just a question of finding it. Don't get discouraged. Until the next time, peace out.